Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. As it has been said on uh, in our chat box, we'll be, we'll be starting um, the next session, 10 past four. So we're just waiting uh, these few minutes and we'll be starting with some excellent panelists. So if you're just grabbing your tea and coffee, please do. And, and let us uh, come together again. Uh, what you can see is, uh, if I am not mistaken, a visual um, summary of, of the previous session. Uh, looks pretty amazing. I hope you all had very good discussion at the previous session. And since it's 10 past four, let us begin with our full session, which will be dedicated to a very practical question indeed of feasibility and scalability of uh, the things we are discussing. And we'll have some excellent, as I already mentioned, excellent panelists. Uh, they will introduce themselves in a short minute, but um, just in the matter of housekeeping, Every panelist will start with a 10 minute presentation. And after that, we'll have questions and answer, answers. I also hope for some interaction between the uh, panelists. My name is Mateusz Piotrowski. I'll be moderating uh, the, uh, today's uh, fourth session. Um, as some colleagues here, for example, Laura, I will also represent uh, Laudato C movement. I'm based in Poland uh, and I work uh, uh, as a um, program advisor of Laudato C movement Poland. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass it to Helen and Kieran Foltz, uh, who um, uh, will introduce themselves, but uh, just for, for, for maybe for, for emphasizing, they have some very on the ground experience with implementing some sustainable um, solutions. So they, they, they make uh, a, a very short introductions of themselves and um, uh, will we'll also explain about their work, how they moved from, from Brussels into, into the Belgian forest and what they are doing there, uh, Helen, Kiaran, to you, the mic is yours. Great, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you quite good. Uh, and you, uh, so it's just just myself here, Kieran, uh, at the moment. Uh, Len is uh, out just collecting the kids and hopefully she might be able to join us just back. We weren't quite sure what time we we're going to come on, but hopefully you'll be able to see her. And very much, you know, I, I, it was a kind of my idea when I was asked to come and speak. I very much thought, you know, of including Len as well as as a couple and, and as a family having having made these these choices together. Uh, over the last 10 years of our marriage and I suppose 12 years of our relationship. Uh, I suppose kind of give a, a bit of my own personal background. Uh, I, I grew up in Ireland uh, and I suppose the, 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 the main formative event or, or formative connection or community in my life has been uh, the connection with the large communities of Jean Vanier. And the large communities were, were communities where uh, volunteers uh, were invited to come and live and share their life with people with intellectual disabilities. And my parents would have joined these communities uh, in the early, early 1980s. I suppose on the back of, you know, all of the, the enthusiasm of Vatican II to really uh, widen this circle of compassion uh, and, and sense of social justice to really include maybe those who hadn't been included in our circle of compassion and community uh, together. Uh, so from that growing up with that uh, and surrounded by that with, with my parents, I really had this sense of this wider human family, this wider human family that I was a part of. I, 
I was, uh, my father's Canadian, my mother's Irish, and we were part of communities in both places. And I suppose growing up, I, I, this sense of this wider circle that I was part of just became obvious for me. And I would have met lots of volunteers coming to these communities who would have been searching for probably maybe a deeper meaning to their life, a sense of community, a sense of belonging. And these would have been people who maybe had, had very successful careers, lots of money, very well educated, but something was somehow missing in their lives. And so that, that really was a deeply kind of formative event for me, a formative, I suppose, background for me. And in the background during all that time, my own personal kind of connection with the natural world, whether it was in the, on the coast in Ireland or in the forests of Canada, you know, I was deeply sensitized. I had very, very lot of, a lot of contact with nature. And those kind of, that kind of was happening at the same time. And as my kind of intellectual journey grew, I, I, I decided to study theology and uh, cultural anthropology uh, in university, really kind of asking these questions, you know, about, you know, what, what is this God? What is this unifying, I suppose, force to the whole cosmos that brings us together? Who is God? What is our identity? And then also looking at the cultural anthropology about the idea of well, what is humanity or who are humans? And realizing as I studied cultural anthropology that soon the word normal went out the door because of so many different ways of doing so many different things as humans. The, the diversity within humanity, I, I found kind of breathtaking and also enriching, but then it, it kind of played in tension with this idea of my search for unity. So what, what unifies us as humans, even though we have all these diverse ways of being humans? And so those are the questions kind of I was living with and kind of, uh, but then there was also this sensitivity to the, the idea that the way that we were living, it wasn't that our species, you know, our, in, in terms of our humanity was destroying nature. It was actually our particular maybe culture or economy or way of being human was damaging to nature. And so I, I would have spent time in, in large communities. I would, I would have studied. And these questions of ecology got deeper and deeper. And I suppose as my parents widened their circle of compassion into kind of including people with disabilities, including people of other religions, including people, you know, from many cultures, the poor, the rich, my own sense of widening the circle of compassion grew into the natural natural world and saying maybe that our, our, our circle of compassion includes maybe all of life and the earth itself. And in that, there was a loneliness. I remember studying my moral theology, asking uh, you know, questions about you know, the rights of animals or the rights of nature. And it seemed to be kind of not on the agenda. It just wasn't there. This was, this was about 15 years before I let out a C really kind of brought the consciousness within to the wider church. And there was a loneliness there. But I was very lucky through, I suppose, kind of searching, how do I bring the sense of, you know, my search for God, my search for this justice of humanity, but also my search of this, how do we live the, in, in a way with the natural world that can be fair, uh, they, they started coming together. And I suppose they came together uh, through the discovery of the work of a man called Thomas Berry and Father Thomas Berry, who some people know and some people who don't know, but uh, Thomas Berry was a, a passionist priest um, uh, an American passionist priest who really took on the work, I suppose, and further the work of Thierry de Chardin, uh, who would have been a very well-known Jesuit in kind of, the, and, and I suppose Thierry, Thierry de Chardin, I remember when I was 17, first hearing of Thierry de Chardin, speaking about this idea of the Omega point, this idea, you know, he was the, Thierry de Chardin was one of the first people to kind of try to weave the sense of the discovery of the evolution of the universe and life into the Christian and Catholic theology. And this idea of this omega point, this something calling from the future into this kind of complexification of our evolution of life. And while Thierry de Chardin brought this mysticism and kind of wonderful kind of weaving uh, into the world of Christian theology of, of evolution, Thomas Berry then brought in the questions of ecology. So what does this mean now about the way that we live? What is our kind of wider community? And those affected me deeply. So the journey that myself and Elena, I suppose, as a couple have been on uh, ha, is a journey that has been both kind of inner and outer. An inner journey and kind of looking at the stories, the, the knowledge, the, the cultural behaviors or habits that we've grown up with. 
Um, and then an outer journey about how do we kind of live uh, into these in a way that is, I suppose, integral. And I suppose that probably, probably the greatest example for me in kind of, I suppose, our life choices uh, probably was probably maybe the arc of the story of Gandhi, who Gandhi, ever be, you know, uh, being a very well-educated and very well-dressed lawyer in London, you know, loving the fine things in life and asking big questions, gradually moved over the course of a lifetime to something very much of voluntary simplicity. And at each stage of his of life, kind of becoming more simple and more integral uh, in his intellectual and the way he lived. So for myself and Alain, that's really been a journey. So for, you know, I, I myself, I'm a teacher in the European schools. And, and uh, when, my, when myself and Alain met, you know, we discussed like what the way we wanted to live and we wanted to live closer to the earth. We wanted to kind of live with a sense of, of justice with the earth. And we know we had plenty of ideas, whether it was from transition towns and Rob Hopkins and all these to permaculture. Uh, but first, I suppose, setting up a family and uh, you know our, ch our first ch our children being born was something that we provided kind of stability for that space, just as they were being born. But after, I suppose, our, our two children were born, uh, when my youngest daughter was two a uh, year and a half, we said, okay, now maybe we want to start making some real clear choices as to how we live not just what we believe or what our values are but how we live and so from that point we decided to well myself I suppose I took a big financial hit I I, I dropped from a full-time down to a part-time work whereas Elaine hadn't been working at all she had been staying home with our children which was a very conscious choice and we decided on one half-time salary to see how we could do this one was spending time together as a family but the other was an idea of becoming closer to nature. And so from there, we, we left Brussels, we left the city. We went to live on a, a permaculture organic farm with another couple and a, a few uh, volunteers about an hour and a half uh, uh, west of Brussels called Boscanter. And Boscanter literally means in Flemish, it means the, you know, the people who live at the edge of the forest. And if Boscanter was very much a way, you could say that we're experimenting with this outer, these outer questions of the, the technical, how do we live closer to the earth? So we moved from a, a six bedroomed house in the, in the suburbs of Brussels, uh, originally moving into one room in a volunteer house plus a tent outside. So our radical simplicity, you know, very much, it, it came very, very quickly. And, you know, lucky it was, you know, just at the end of the summer, so we, we were still warm. Uh, and then we, you know, we, we moved into all the experiments of, okay, all of the food that we were eating, we were also growing. Aaron, the... sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. We need to be coming slowly to uh, the end of your this part of your presentation. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, if you're coming just, to conclusion, just... and maybe later also when there will be a Q and A quest, uh, part, we can, you know, dig deeper into. Um... Absolutely, I'll just I'll just kind of kind of finish off. So, what we basically did, I suppose, we moved into a situation where we we're growing our own food, eating our own food, and. Um, and then, you know, just kind of, you know, just cu cutting the wood that heated our house, that, that cooked the food and really, really living uh, a radical simplicity. And I suppose it's, it's from there that our journey as a, as a family has been this idea of trying to live a radical simplicity, but also really trying to walk that deep interior journey of some of the bigger kind of intellectual, emotional or spiritual questions. Thank you so much. I think it really is an, a great introduction uh or, or or for to to our our discussion today and i'll pass it now to dr elizabeth sawin i hope i'm spelling it right if not please correct me um who's a renewed scholar with many titles uh and many affiliation but she's also um, founder and director of the multi-solving institute so um uh, uh, Dr. Sawin, please feel free also to introduce yourself in a few more words. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope we'll, we'll even in this part of your presentation or maybe later on in the discussion, we'll have a chance to discuss uh, because Karen really gave this personal, well, you could even say a testimony, but the um, whole panel is uh, asks the questions about scalability so it would be really interesting for me to hear 
how can we make this kind of life um, accessible uh, for more people or how this kind of sustainable life, life could look like on a bigger scale. So I'll pass it now to uh, you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for having me here. Um, panels are such an interesting thing because um, you know you don't know the speakers ahead of time. Uh, uh, but I really enjoyed Karen hearing your story. And although I'm here to speak, as you say, about the global scale and multi-solving, I'll just um, I'll name something about myself, which is for 20 years I've lived in an eco village that my family uh, were founders of in the U.S. Uh, northeast in the state of Vermont. Um, and so my children are, are young adults now, and Karen, yours are, are so much younger, but um, we could compare some notes there. And Thomas Berry was a very important teacher of mine, his work very important to me. So um, although I'm not a theologian, my background is in systems analysis and complex systems theory. Um, I think the two are very, um, you know, mirror each other, right? We're in this complex, interconnected, integral world. It is whole, um, even though our current systems break things up into parts. And so systems theory is um, really about the question of how to live with elegance in, um, in the face of that complexity and interconnection. And I think that's one of the most important functions of religion as well. Um, so multi-solving is an idea that uh, I've been working on for the last eight years or so, but in many ways, it's um, a culmination of my work in systems theory. I've uh, spent a lot of time uh, programming computer simulations of global climate change and going to UN climate talks, um, trying to encourage countries to come up with policies to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions faster. Um, and an interesting thing happened to me at, you know, to some extent, that very privileged position, right, of billions of people on Earth. Why am I one of the ones who's here at the United Nations uh, trying to bring more progress on climate change? But I, one thing I came to see was how much was being left out of those negotiations, which I call them now carbon centric. They really are focused, you know, importantly on CO2, the greenhouse gas. Um, but there the framing is, is often about like almost the right to pollute. Uh, countries talk about the right to atmospheric space. They talk about how the wealthy countries have consumed more than their fair share, um, which is true, you know, absolutely true. There's a, a global north and global south equity issue in that. But the, the, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that often what's left out are all the ways in which our societies will be better, healthier, more equitable, more just, with more human well being once we manage this transition away from fossil fuels? And so, multi solving um, in systems theory, we talk about expanding the boundaries um, of, of what we're studying. And so, if the carbon centric frame has a kind of narrow boundary on technology and greenhouse gases, Multi-solving tries for a much wider boundary. It, it asks the question, uh, what else will be better on a world that's free from fossil fuels? And what's the way of acting together um, to create those possibilities? And uh, the, the definition, if I'm teaching about multi-solving, I talk about um, investments, projects, and policies that solve multiple problems at the same time. Um, so classic example would be, closing down a coal-fired power plant. Um, that is a, obviously a climate solution for the long-term, but for anyone who lives downwind of that fossil fuel um, combustion source in the short-term, that's also a win for health. It's fewer children with asthma, fewer people with respiratory illnesses. So that's multi-solving, one action producing multiple benefits. Um, one of the things that our institute uh, has done, and you can check this out at multisolving.org is our website, is um, case studies around the world of people working in this way. And so I'll share a couple because it becomes more, more clear in the examples. Um, one is a project in New Zealand called Warm Up New Zealand. It was an energy efficiency project. So it took homes um, and replaced their boilers, gave them better windows, insulation in the attics. 
But um, in that project, the interesting thing they did was they brought in health impact analysis and they looked at the health of people living in those homes. And in fact, they found there were fewer hospitalizations, less money spent on medicine. And in fact, the health system savings were um, three times bigger than the cost of um, the energy efficiency upgrades. So that's an example of multi-solving where we're tackling the long-term question of climate in a way that's making people's lives better in the short term. Um, reducing food waste, making it possible for children to walk to school, making cities greener so that they stay cooler, so that water gets soaked into the soil instead of creating um, a flooding hazard. Each of those is an example of multi-solving. Cycling infrastructure that increases people's access to physical activity while reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. Um, you just need to start thinking about these interconnections and um, the possibilities are, they're frankly, endless and untapped in my mind. Um, to give you a sense of the scale, the World Health Organization um, has reported time and again now at this point, ever since 2018, uh, once a year at the time of the UN climate talks, they put out a report and what they say is that the costs of being on track to meet the Paris climate change um, targets those costs are more than outweighed, and now I'm kind of I'm quoting the World Health Organization, more than outweighed by the health benefits of reducing fossil fuels. And so those are those respiratory um, illnesses, but other things like premature birth and stroke and heart disease and dementia, Alzheimer's, all of those are being linked to PM 2.5, the small particles um, that are so bad for our health. So, you know, at this moment when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying we're in this rapidly closing window um, to provide a livable earth. Another major global organization is saying, but, but actually doing something about that pays for itself. And that we sit in this gap where the International Energy Agency also this year tells us that we're seeing record high greenhouse gas emissions. So there is this conundrum of, um, you know, the basic logic of we do things if they're gonna pay off, we can't seem to connect those dots for climate change. So the work of the Multi-Solving Institute is to try to help make those synergies go from just theoretical possibilities to things that actually happen on the ground. Um, and that disconnect isn't just at the global level. You see it in cities where public health uh, department officials are not involved in transportation plans, even though we just listed all these ways in which transportation and health are, are intimately connected. Um, we often don't have um, the interests of gender equity or racial equity or economic equity woven into our climate and energy policy. But um, at a moment of you know, such obvious, morally wrong and uh, practically just uh, destructive inequities around our, our planet, if we have to rebuild everything in order to address climate change, the opportunities to rebuild it in a way that um, aren't only equitable, but address past harms is also unprecedented. But if you don't have um, experts and the perspective of racial, gender, or economic equity, and you just leave it to energy and climate planners, those synergies and possibilities get left behind. Um, so if, do I have one more minute? Uh, yeah, so maybe the last thing I would say is, is a little bit about why we think this is, why there is this gap between what's possible and, um, and what seems to be happening. And as systems experts, what we see it as a failure of system design. Um, the world is, as I said at the beginning, whole and interconnected and indivisible. Yet um, the dominant culture, and, and again, I would agree with Karen on this, not all cultures, but the dominant culture, the power structures of today divide the world into pieces, right? We have disciplines in our education where health and climate are separate to things you can study. Uh, in our decision-making, we have budgets and jurisdictions, and we have you know, within a state, the, the health decisions made in one building by one set of people, the climate and energy decisions being made elsewhere. Um, within our communities, we have all of these um, borders and barriers, whether they're different cultures, languages, 
races and so on. And so the work of multi-solving, we talk of it as the work of rewiring systems, of healing these fra artificial fractures, um, which is really about growing relationships, whether that's between a health expert and a climate expert, or between um, you know, a white leader of a foundation and an African-American um, uh, grandmother who leads a neighborhood association. Uh, so growing relationships at the end of the day is what we see as um, as the solution that's needed to take these just theoretical opportunities that the World Health Organization tells us it could pay for itself. How do we get there? How do we make the thing that's best for the whole happen? We think it happens with the work of uh, growing relationships. And um, maybe in the, in the question and answer, we can talk about some of the forms that might take. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh... We are not move, now moving to our next speaker, Dr. Mark Charlesworth, um, uh, who, who um, holds a PhD from Keele University on sustainable development, and who's also engaged um, specifically in research on how Catholic institutions might become more sustainable. So um, I'll pass it, to, pass it to you, uh, Dr. Charles Worth. Also, please uh, introduce you, yourself in a few words and feel free to start with your 10 minutes presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you for the uh, invitation and already some excellent presentations. Um, before I start, I wanted to pick up something from the last presentation. I think it's a really important point was made right at the end is there's lots of love that is allowed out OC, if it doesn't have that name, that happens in many places and it isn't picked up by uh, the media, isn't reported. I, I presume it could be this because it doesn't um, deliver advertising revenue and I'll come back to that. Um, I think you've given me quite enough as, of, of, a, of an introduction, so we'll, we'll, we'll skip that. Um, so I will try and share my slides. Da, da, da. So um, this is the, the task that I, I set myself. We'll skip over that. So just to give a, you know, how I will sort of look at it, I'll look at justice. This will be fairly academic, unfortunately. Um, this, this, this uh, look at justice fairly directly. Look at ecological transition. Look at social and labour rights. But that's not my specialism. I'm glad there's an extra speaker being added uh, during the day, so, so I can I can relax a little on that. And this was all right, really all really rather last minute, and then. Uh, get to a conclusion about living differently and, and a flavour of what that might be. So a key thing, perhaps particularly from a political philosophy point of view, is that the idea of justice is contested. Um, and there's at least three broad ways that it, it can be looked at through, when we we've looked at this, and uh, people have already mentioned this, in regards to rights, laws, and the legal system. And so... Um, property rights for indigenous communities is a really sort of quite uh, key question uh, that isn't dealt with well with the legal system. Um, and then another sort of idea of ethics in philosophy is um, uh, consequentialism and, and utilitarianism, sort of economics. And even in that, there is a justice component in that many people that would advocate economic growth will um, emphasize property rights. Uh, and that, 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 that's often and po often poorly understood to be based on John Locke's uh, labor theory of, of property. And in that account of property um, that, you know, uh, things become the property of an individual because they put work into it, he, even he says, that they should leave enough and as good. And he, and he also has a very explicit virtue context. So, so if you read his account of labour theory, it's bookended either end by a, a, a quite a, a Thomist uh, virtue idea. And then I want to look, look in a little bit more depth at virtue, where, where this is a, a broadly Catholic um, event. So let's, uh, let's start with where the Catholic Church would sort of tend to start with, with ethics. So to give, um, Aquinas talks a lot about uh, virtue, but just to give a flavour, the just man gives to another what is 
what is his through the consideration of the common good. Justice is observed towards all. Um, so that's that's one part of the um, uh, a flavour of, of what Aquinas is uh, thinking about when he thinks about justice. And for Aquinas, all absolutely, he speaks more effectively, he speaks more about justice of humans to God. And in, in, in a sense, it's because it's good for humans to sort of think about God rightly. Um, but, but there's also some, some sort of sense of justice towards creation. And Kieran has mentioned how, which is quite problematic, but although grace before meals is said to God, there's, there's the, 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 the gratitude isn't just a God, I don't think is, 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 is probably fair to say. So for Aquinas, property rights are vital, but not to be abused. So um, the disciples picking the ears of corn uh, from the Gospels it would be sort of a, uh, a relevant example. Another sort of aspect is in exchange. So fair trade, but that sort of is, is sort of a sticking plaster, is, is simplifying hugely. Or trade justice, about making the systems of trade fair for everybody. And picks up things such as the golden rule. So... Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, and that's what picks up on, on uh, e even uh, John Rawls' veil of ignorance. And then in distribution, this is this, I'm going to give this a little bit more more sort of depth of, of analysis. So my understanding, Aquinas isn't definitive about what distribution would be in practice. Basically, on the basis of the the principle of subsidiarity, it would be down for individual communities to to make those uh, sorts of uh, decisions themselves. But, uh, and this is sort of going somewhat beyond Aquinas, this is, this is me reading into Aquinas. So if there are um, Aquinas scholars in the audience uh, that disagree with me, feel free to put that in the chat or we can chat afterwards. Um, we're all equal in the sight of God. And, and there are scholars who think that's actually a more robust basis of equality, of, of giving rights, um, to, 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 and, and protecting individuals than uh, more liberal um, uh, ideas. Um, historical omissions and harm would have consideration in a virtue um, notion of, of uh, ecological justice or climate justice. Need would be a factor uh, though that would be perhaps at least partly in the virtue of charity. So, for example, somebody that is in a, in a wheelchair that is not able to cycle might have a need to um, emit more uh, CO2 emissions than somebody who can walk or cycle. And it might be that particular responsibilities, for example, politicians, but a distinctly slippery slope argument, and and um, uh, climate um, academics is is is, is another distinctly slippery slope, but but potentially responsibilities to do things might allow a greater um, share of 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 of, of our climate budget if that's such a thing. Um, Another sort of key idea from Aquinas is liberality, being generous, but in keeping enough to support family. But a key thing, I think, um, and this isn't just Aquinas, this is um, Aristotle and basically all the world religions, it's a bit more complicated, that it's never for wealth or comfort or pleasure. It is always for the common good. So, so, so um, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil rather than money itself is is uh, is so just to sort of on 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 pick what ecological injustice is because it's actually easier to sort of describe what injustice is than it, than what what it is to describe what justice is things like race so, so there's lots of evidence um and many it sort of came to prominence in the united states where poor neighborhoods and particularly poor black neighborhoods is where the nasty ecological things happened in the United States and gender. Typically, environmental problems affect women and, and children. And I've already mentioned the, the, uh, the importance of, of indigenous people. That's been recognized in the United Nations um, uh, 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 regulations for, 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 for 30 years. 
Um, wealth gives power, which, which, which allows injustice. Future generations are often ignored. Creation is often ignored. Age is, is often ignored. Disability is often you know, where injustice happens. So, so poor people uh, t- tend to have uh, be in, in receipt of ecological injustice. Um, and it's also power and wealth makes progress difficult. So, so there's been lots of talk at, a, at an international level about addressing injustice, but the US power, because of their wealth, has meant that it hasn't been able to get beyond talking. And a a key thing is procedurally existing uh, power and wealth, so so for example, um, tends to be rich countries who are able to send delegates to be involved in the IPCC and the UNFCCC process. Or a key um, sort of, core reason for hope is that justice is unavoidable in order to address climate change it basically will not happen for a range of reasons uh which we've hinted at in the, in the paper that's linked from from the uh, from the title so so justice will have to happen in order to address climate change donut justice mmm donuts mmm donuts this is the donut i'm particularly thinking about so th- our we can talk talk more about this um but um these are planetary boundaries on the outside, it's been mentioned already, um, but inside there's some sort of social sort of thoughts about what needs to happen. But a key thing before I move on from this slide is that for at least three of these um, planetary boundaries, we do not know where the boundary is. Humanity does not know that boundary, which for people of faith is less of a problem than it is for um, uh, uh, people that, that are secular. So just speak briefly about ecological, ecological transition. I think, and um, I think Aquan would back me up on this, it has to be about less consumption because greed can always outstrip technology. So factor four is great, but um, there's plenty of evidence that um, greed, uh, if, if we get more efficient, actually we use more things. And again, there's broad agreement uh, amongst the world religions. So less consumption can absolutely allow capitalism but it won't be capitalism as we know it. And coming back to the, the, the point from the previous session is advertising deliberately sets out to make people feel miserable so they will buy a new car, they will buy an iPhone. And that's sort of very much against basically all, all the world, all, all the regions. So an ecological transition might allow more time with community, friends and family, more time using gifts that edify than gain, shorter working week potentially, and less commuting, or working week might be artisanal and sort of formal, um, less dangerous work. So the idea of natural step would sort of naturally lead to potentially less dangerous uh, work. Um, a key barrier is neo-prosperity theology. Jesus always criticised seeking wealth and riches. Um, permaculture has been mentioned and some sort of um, interesting examples uh, in, in links. Key practical idea. Um, and more sort of picking up on, on early presentations, more local artisan production, such as linen clothes, which linen can be produced anywhere, whereas cotton can only be grown in particular locations and slow food. Uh, social and labour rights are rooted in rooted in virtue. So Las Casas and United Nations um, direct, Universal Declaration on Human Rights for lock property rights were rooted in virtue, just transition. Um, citizens with less power need protection from the powerful. Property rights beyond the leaders, I've already mentioned this. Assistance with, with transition. So miners, uh, if they become out of work, they might need some help training to install solar panels or, um, and sort of picking up on part of what this was uh, intended to be is, we need to be a little bit wary of focusing too much on, on members rather than the common good. Um, but as was recognized by um, uh, by the Pope in Rerum Novarum in 1891, Unions have been absolutely essential to the progress of justice because they balance power against capital. And all all the world religions are critical of people insisting on rights to consume to hoard and uh, pleasure. So conclusion, living living more communally, which is relatively easy for Catholics, less consumerism, I think it's fair to say um, difficult for everybody, but there's a need for something else other than uh, consumerism to be offered. So, So that's effectively down to religions to sort of um, uh, offer that. And, and religious communities have long offered, specifically religious communities have long offered that, and there's some links. Uh, that's really, but the, the first link is to an example in um, 
in uh, Zimbabwe, a communal uh, permaculture project. project. Um, uh, Rudolf Barrow had talked uh, in the 1970s about when the ecological cataclysm happens, that there'll be something like um, what happened in the Middle Ages where um, the, the um, Benedictines preserved elements of, uh, of, of civilization. So it should be a very, my view, a very different capitalism and society if it's not consumer capitalism, um, but it could be much better, as has been hinted by other speakers earlier, much better for everybody, including the wealthy. Um, and something to sort of think about is climate catastrophe will bring, will bring everybody, uh, even paid trolls, to their knees in prayer. When things get bad, which are starting to, to happen, um, we're now in the situation of present, preventing, of, of making the, the, cat, the cat catastrophe less of a catastrophe than, than, it, uh, than it might be, rather than continuing broadly the way we are. So that's me, Don. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation, which uh, brought, um, uh, again, maybe a good, created a good bridge between uh, personal um, testimony from the first, um, our first speaker, systemic thinking, well organized in Thomistic way, and the um, matters our um, last panelist will um, spoke to, which are labor rights situation of um, communities we call trade unions. Uh, and also different, difficult, dif different, complex, and sometimes even complicated um, relations between um, uh, labor, labor organizations, and environmental and climate um, justice and uh, just transition. Uh, so. I pass it now to Lorenzo Rosso, who's an Italian trade unionist uh, and a representative of a trade union that, that stands for more than 200 workers in, ag in agriculture. So again, a very interesting uh, thing link because we've been talking quite a lot about food production. So without further ado, I pass it to, uh, to Mr. Lorenzo Rosso uh, Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mateus. I hope you hear me well. I will try to be brief, I promise, even if I am a trade unionist. So it is not uh, easy <laughs> for us. Um, well, first of all, um, a few minutes about me. I am uh, Lorenzo Rosal, an Italian trade unionist. I work for FICISL, the National Italian Union that represents around uh, 220,000 workers in agriculture and in related activities in the food industry, in forests, in fishing. Currently, I am uh, an, uh, one of the national coordinators of trade unionists present in some food industry group, groups and member of the EWC, European Work Council of some important multinational companies. Uh, so my main activities in PAICISL, uh, in national, uh, in my national trade union, are about um, collective bargaining agreement and labor relation. And I am also a PhD candidate at the University of Study in Siena about industrial relations and uh, agri-food global value chains. So um, I bring you the greetings of the National Secretary General of the FICIS, Leonor Ferrota, who unfortunately cannot be present with us. Um, as I said, uh, we have over 220,000 associated workers. And uh, we are present in so many workplaces. I want to congratulate the European Laudato Si Alliance for today's interesting event, full of, full of uh, speeches and contents. 
because it is so important the, the, um, that trade union that the, so many stakeholders can speak each other, can speak each other and uh, make stakeholders. For a trade union like ours, the just transition is a fundamental question. We meet them in many companies every day. Our commitment has always been to make this ecological transition possible for everyone, as the title of our panel states. We often hear about green jobs. What are they? In Italy, the job market is slowly opening up to these new opportunities. The professions of the future are linked, for example, to energy saving, the reforestation of non-urban areas, and the green economy more generally. For example, there is an increasing demand for specialized agricultural personnel to improve resource savings and reduce environmental impact. Figures such as uh, solar panel technicians, chemical experts, project managers will be increasingly in demand in labor market. Companies will look for more and more figures of this type to be able to adapt to the times and not to miss the opportunities that the rapidly growing market will offer. So that's a, a challenge that the trade union is going to face these uh, these needs these needings by the companies in italy alone green workers are are already over 3 million 13 percent of the total number of workers other buzzwords include uh, upskilling and reskilling what does that mean in practice to do this we follow it three steps as trade union, as FICIS. The first is to ensure a bridge between the old and new professions, even in the more traditional sectors. We must accompany the generational challenge that this implies. We have to stay close to the workers, get to know them and know their trade listen to their concerns, finding solutions together. The second, the second step is to identify the skills and qualifications needed for change. The third is a new relationship between school and work, which must talk to each other again. We need to change the agenda of training integrating it with digital skills, green skills, transversal skills. So we need to improve the skills of the workers already present in the companies, ensure ongoing training. At the same time, we must prepare the workers for tomorrow to find and keep jobs. That's a new role for the trade unions in the labor market. But the most important question is, who will pay the social cost of the ecological transitions? As a trade union, we take up this challenge. We propose ourselves as a partner for change. I agree with uh, Professor Charlesworth about the importance of unionism in that. We do not want to limit to bargaining the quality and the quantity of work in the company. But as trade union, we also want to deal with what to produce and how to produce. That's the revolution. What to produce, for example, sustainable products and how to produce, for example, production processes and their impact on the environment. For this, the key, the key point is an international dimension, is necessary. 
especially as regards relations with multinationals in the food industry. We have to network with other stakeholders in the area and in the global context. That's why a moment like this, it's very important for us and for the Laudato Si. We want to represent that world now manned only by environmental associations and citizens' committees. However, we do not want to limit ourselves only to mobilizing the energies of civil society. We want to make those energies in the proposals. Our strategic role is that of a hinge. We are going to be a hinge because we are present both inside and outside companies at the same time. We have the skills and the organizational skills that are often lacking in other environmental movements. So what we, we, what we are going to propose to the other movements is an alliance for that. We can do it together. Lastly, as a trade union, we are pursuing the territorial dimension, which is fundamental for us. How to promote the growth of the value of the territory, how to build the shared goals locally rather than internationally. The role of the trade union is, fund is fundamental. The cost of the transition cannot be paid only by those who work for a living. It must be shared. It must be a common commitment. This is the meaning of the union. Thank you all. I remain available for any questions. Sorry for my English. I'm not, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying to improve it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo, for a truly excellent and really stimulating presentation. Uh, yeah, and I think that um, we really, what we have heard in all those four presentations is an example of multi-solving at work, uh, coming from many dimensions and, and looking for translating the concept uh, Catholic social teaching brings, like participation, uh, subsidiarity, um, um, all, all, all those things we, we've heard in more theoretical presentations into practice, into thinking, how do we work? How do we eat? How do we uh, commute? How long we work? And all, all that, ha that has been mentioned. Uh, uh, please, uh, to uh, all the participants, uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat box. Uh, so I can also pass it to uh, our panelists. But while we wait, while I'm waiting for for um, any questions that might might come via the chat box, um, let me ask uh, firstly just one question um, to to Lorenzo. You've mentioned that uh, the um, green jobs constitute bigger and bigger part of the Italian trade um, labor market. And I suppose that's the case, or that will be the case in many other countries. Are those jobs unionized? Would you call them all, not only green jobs, but also quality jobs? And uh, if that's not the case or not to the um, extent that is needed, what should happen to change the situation. So green jobs are perceived as, as quality jobs by the workers and their community. Thank you, Mateus. So um, this is the challenge for our union because uh, the rate of the green jobs is growing and growing year by year. And we have to syndicalize them. And uh, this is the challenge. That's why we, uh, as trade union, we represent also green jobs like the workers uh, in, the, um, in the consortium of water in Italy, that, uh, that uh, the consortium in Italy that gives uh, water for the fields. So this is a part of the green jobs that we actually yet 
represents. But the challenge is to represent also the jobs and the workers of the green jobs of the future. And uh, it is not easy for us because they are linked so much with the digitalizing world. And as trade union, we have to regenerate ourselves to, uh, we have to learn speaking new languages because uh, green jobs, uh, the, the green workers are young, are digitalized, are um, um, fast. And the trade union must change his languages, must change also his places, because these workers, they are not in the same places we are uh, that we know that we know. They they work in different places. They work in the house in the houses. They work in the common working in the co-working places. So these are the places that we are not common to, to, to attend as trade union, but that's the challenge. And we can do it only with a new generation of trade unionists. A new generation of trade unionists that must be grown by, from that workers. We have to um, select the new trade unionist officer between the green workers, because they only, um, only a green worker known exactly how it we, how it was, how it is works as green workers. Great, thank you so much. Um, and um, targeting. Uh, uh, a, a question perhaps to uh, uh, our our first and second speaker sp talking from the respective perspectives how do you envision uh, those kind of um, solutions that uh, Karen for example spoke about being scaled up and uh, if I um, uh, may um, clarify this question a bit or maybe make it even more difficult. In Kieran's um, story, the spiritual dimension seemed to be quite important in like personal spiritual journey. So it's easier to speak about scaling up some technical or organizational solutions but uh, yeah, isn't it even harder when we mm, um, think that for a genuine transformation, also some kind of mental, spiritual transformation on a bigger scale is needed? But this is, I wouldn't even reduce this question to the, our first two speakers. I think uh, Dr. Charles was with his uh, kind of ethical, but very, very... Um, uh, uh, rooted in prudence kind of Thomistic approach uh, would also have some 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 interesting things to um, speak to speak to this um, problem maybe. So please feel free whoever whoever uh, feels uh, like answering this question go first. Um. Sure, sure, yeah, um, I suppose, because I, I didn't really get on to kind of that idea of scalability, you know, obviously what, what I'm talking about is, you know, very much as a family, we made life choices to kind of, you know, live this more simple life closer to the earth. And I suppose kind of living that, you know, like when you're having to make choices about, you know, finance and, and all of these, one of the things that we came to realize in terms of scalability in, in, um, in this is access to land and housing. In that, you know, the biggest, I think, uh, owner of farmland in the United States is Bill Gates. This, this is where he's put his fortune. He's actually gotten it out of cash or metals. And now the actual worth is this farmland. And to have access to land or even access to housing is the greatest barrier in some ways, I would say, to environmental justice. Like in a sense, I need to go work 
and earn so much money in maybe industries or jobs that I don't agree with so that I can buy my way out of the city. I cannot access the countryside because of the price of land, because of speculation, because of so much money being hoarded there. And I would say the scalability, I would say, you know, we, we talk about maybe a redistribution of wealth, you know, having grown up in Ireland, like we, we were lucky enough at the foundation of the state to have a redistribution of land from those who had been peasants and those who'd been renting only, only a century ago, we had a wide, wide redistribution of land. And so this sense of justice for me, like I know when we're talking, you know, my wife and me have had many debates about, you know, do we take a mortgage? Do we not take a mortgage? Yeah. And, and how, how is this? And, and it really is about this access and, and justice. Excuse me, there's some background noise. Are you available so, uh, if, if our technical support can yeah. make you to the participants who won't be speaking. Um, I will be doing it. And to Mr. I, Mr. I should be, uh, James Bernard Walsh, yeah. if you could please uh, mute your microphone. Yeah, just yeah. 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 um, be careful. Yeah. In any case, yeah. uh, uh, Professor Sawin, please feel free to, to comment on uh, whatever you found important uh, in the previous presentation or to okay. answer that question of scalability. And if our technical person could try to mute all other participants. Thank you so much. So, so, so to you, Professor Sawin, and maybe then we'll also have uh, some, some other question also to Dr. Charles Wolf. Well, I think this is the is one of the most important questions about scaling and spreading. And one thing that we say about multi-solving is that it is a way as well as a what. So I talked a lot about particular projects, right? Insulating homes or building bike paths. But the other thing about multi-solving um, that we see is a common set of attitudes and approaches across all these different cultures, scales, geographies, sectors, is the way people go about it. And it's a way that's based on um, cultivating relationships, on establishing trust, on prioritizing the causes of other people's suffering as much as your own, as your own. So if I'm a climate activist, it means shifting to a way of working where I care as much about um, your child with asthma as I do about the long-term climate. And so uh, when you refer to, you know, whether you use words like a shift in consciousness or worldview or spirituality, I think there's, there's different words for it. But one of the opportunities for multi-solving is to both address these problems, some of which are existential problems, um, and make practical progress, but to undertake it in a way that comes from a different consciousness than the one that created the problems. Um, and what we find is that that is quite a, um, what would I say, maybe empowering feeling, right? That these problems are so huge. Some of them are of global scale. We find ourselves in companies, in villages, in neighborhoods, um, but multi-solving says that you can start where you are, cultivate an attitude that's based on reciprocity and mutuality and solidarity and support and make practical progress. Um, and I think that is, is the path to scale. And systems theory teaches us that systems can transform suddenly and unexpectedly. And so keeping going consistently oriented toward values and vision um, is probably in my mind more important than having some plan where you can see this is how it's all going to work out like we're in the uncertainty in these times but we can be grounded in our ethic in our values in um, our way of being and acting uh, i'll pass it to dr to dr charlesworth there's some interesting questions in the chat box but we were we are heading towards the end, so I think we only have uh, space for one question. But first, please, uh, Professor. I'm not sure to add much to what uh, Kieran and, and uh, Elizabeth uh, had to say on that. So, next question. Uh, so let me uh, read the question from uh, Michael Kuhn. Do I understand right that you see digitalized jobs more or less automatically as green? What about the huge use of energy needed for digitalization of all aspects of our daily life? 
can this really be uh, the way forward? So again, any um, uh, uh, of our panelists who feels like addressing this, this question is free to, um, to do so. I'm happy to make a start on that. Um, Digitalization is not automatically going to be green. Um, if you're looking, if you're comparing a, uh, uh, a job in a coal mine or a power station, coal-fired power station with um, digitalization, then, then yes. But not only is there quite a lot of energy used in you know, the infrastructure of the internet, you know, the computers and the phones and the you know, VR headsets and all that sort of thing, you know, they have an environmental impact. So, so, so simply moving into sort of, sort of you know, more digitalized, there's, there's no guarantee. So, so that there's, there's a need to consider that. And a, a sort of a complication that um, talked back to an earlier presentation is in the 1990s, the European Union wanted to do life cycle assessments and give um, eco labels to everything, and they gave up because the, you know, if you've got and this is uh, an example from from that period, if you've got lead in petrol uh, making people stupid, or you've got benzene in unleaded petrol giving people cancer, well, which which is better? And that's that's the same for. Um, uh, you know, com comparing di di digitalized jobs with, with other jobs, which is well, coming back to a, a point that I made earlier is you know, we've got to reduce consumption because we don't know, it's very difficult to know, um, you know what technical improvements will actually, you know, if you reduce reduce consumption, it's, it's still not that straightforward, but if you reduce consumption, that is sort of necessarily reducing environmental impact. But if you change from one thing to another, you might cause other problems and, and the knowing of it is. Um, so that's my answer for now. Th thank you so much, Professor. I would uh, personally love to continue this conversation. There are so many questions, for example, to explore the notion of territoriality. Uh, I think this 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 would again bring all the um, uh, speakers together on uh, thinking what um, perhaps opportunities lay ahead while we're speaking of making the production chains uh, shorter and bringing production back to the local area and perhaps what are also the disadvantages of this like rolling back our um, connections, if even if they were pretty unjust with other parts of the world, especially in the times of geopolitical tensions. So uh, there's definitely much more to be discussed in um, uh, next meetings and next panels, but to keep uh, um, the prudence of uh, you know making proper breaks and not spending too much time digital, uh, I'll take the liberty to thank to uh, thanks thank all the speakers for, uh, to thank all the participants who were here uh, actively listening and to thank the organizers as well. And um, yes, we hope to um, see you uh, in Elsia or whatever other um, arrangement to discuss and to put all those things we've been discussing in practice. Thank you so much and um, have a very good afternoon.